Hello and welcome everybody to 1958. The thing that stands out to me about 1958 was the 1958 Masters over everything else. Arnold Palmer won, but not without controversy. He was playing, by the way, those awesome Wilson Dynapower like staff model irons. Beautiful. Not too dissimilar from the McGregor, which I'm going to show you today. And he had a little run in with some rules because he had a plugged line. He was like, I think I'm allowed to drop. But there were, you know, there, everybody was like, no, you can't have a drop. And so he played his ball and then he ended up hitting a five on that hole. But then he's like, I'm allowed to drop. So he took a drop and played a second ball. And then he scored a three, you know, with his dropped ball. So the question arose, you know, for a couple of holes, they were deliberating. And then finally, Bobby Jones, who founded the Masters was like, came and told him, you're three stands. It's funny, like how that played out. Also, in 19, if I'm correct on this, correct me if I'm wrong, 1958 is when they named Amen Corner, Amen Corner on Augusta National. Am I correct in thinking that? Anyway, so it was a, a pretty big year. However, I think about that, like 1958, and now it's just kind of a footnote in history. But I wonder, like, if, he, if that happened now, he would be all over Twitter. Everyone would be like, he's a cheater. And people would be like, no, he's not. And they would go back and forth. And there's always this discussion about how everybody knows best. It's funny how rules are, some people are really like set on finding the cheaters. If you watch NFL football, it's just like every play there's a hold. Every play there's pass interference. It's like every possible rule that could be broken, it's just, they're always pushing the limits of those. And I think that's kind of one of the job, it's like your job as a professional athlete. You wanna use the rules to the best of your ability and you wanna do the best you can within the limits of the rules, which means you're gonna be pushing those boundaries. I don't, in my opinion, he wasn't cheating, you know, he played both balls and he was willing to accept either score. So I think he did the right thing there. Anyway, anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Do you guys remember that? I don't, I just remember, I read a lot about masters because it's has an, a fun history. So we have here the 1958 McGregor offering in the irons world. Does it compare to the Wilson? Let's get this on the review table and have a closer look. So these backs can identify a lot about the club, but let's step through this particular club. We're going to start with the aft portion here with all the markings. Start down here by the, the sole. The heel says PT2. Closer to the toe, it says patent. D, and then it has this patent ID number right here. You can actually look that up on the US Patent Registry. And then here in the middle, it says McGregor in this curved design with an arrow, two arrows pointing out from, what is that? Some sort of like compass or something. And then underneath, tourney with the same curve pattern. Here at the top line toe, it says recessed weight which is interesting because if you think about that with modern clubs, it's like a cavity, but this is like the opposite of a cavity because it's like a muscle back with this like stealth bomber shape. That's what they called it back in the 50s because they knew about stealth in the 50s, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the awesome toe profile. This is what I love. Look at this. You can actually see the muscle like come out here with these ridges right here. It's so cool. The heel profile, very similar. Looking at the face, what on earth is going on here? We have a copper face. I remember recently, sometime in the last, is it 10 years? I don't even remember. Mizuno was saying that we put copper underneath our chrome so it's softer. Well, here's copper on the face exposed. We have some triangles lined up with the grooves. Did I say triangles? Diamonds lined up with the grooves on either side. And the heel is pretty flat right here. I mean, it comes to a kind of a square toe right here not any, if any, forgiveness on that leading edge. It's pretty sharp. Looking for some offset here. I don't see any. Let's see if this thing will focus for us. Sometimes the camera will cooperate and sometimes it won't. There we go. All right, I just gotta get my hands out of the picture. So I'm not seeing much offset. Look at that top line, very squarish. It looks good. I mean, it looks pretty thick. It's not like a really thin hickory blade or anything. The ferrule kind of attracts some attention here. So moving up the hosel, we can see it is pinned. You can see it on either side. Then we have this, these X embellishments around here. 
where you would normally find the decorative <laughs> knurling, whatever you may call it, but there's some X stamps right here. We have the registration number here on the ferrule. We have a yellow, gold yellow ferrule pattern here. Is that gold or silver? I can't, it's always hard to tell on some of these. We move up the shaft, which has seen, man, I peeled off like six price tags on this thing. It's seen many owners, I'm sure. This is my sticker I put on. I added, I took off, you know, a bunch of stickers and I put my own sticker on, 1958, just to remind me. You can see here, Propel Action, number two, by McGregor. Lovely, they put copper here too, to match the copper face. And then we have this leather grip, which has no markings on the butt. So lovely leather wrapped, copper faced iron. What more could we possibly need? I guess the only thing left to do is get this out on the range and show you how it does. McGregor Turney PT2 copper face. Looks really good. This is a uh, 1958. So one of the comments, somebody said that this was a club that Jack Nicholas played in the, uh, what was it? World of Sports something golf thing that they had on TV back in the day. And I looked, I think those were the ceramic face. This is the copper face, but still, I think one of the most beautiful clubs, one of those beautiful irons ever made. You saw in the close up, just everything about this seems high quality. So I'm excited to have a go with these. See how it feels. I'm going to be aiming generally towards that 250 marker. I think the trampoline is what you guys are going to be seeing. That's generally where I'm aiming. I'm just going to take some easy swings here at first to start off. See how it feels. And I suspect that's wind carrying. What about 150? Which is good for me for a 7 iron. Don't know if you can see the ball strike right there right in the middle. I mean, these are weighted and balanced. After I hit that um, hickory niblick that James Spence, I have a whole new appreciation for well-balanced, for well-balanced clubs. I mean, they're just so, so lovely. Hitting into the wind, the wind's kind of, kind of coming into and from left to right. It's funny, like I, when I edit my videos, I always watch myself out here and like, I'm surprised at how often I get my left and right confused. So I have no complaints about these. These are actually, are these my, I've hit two shots with it and I feel like these are my favorite golf irons ever from the, from the 50s. I just can't think of anything I'd rather play, even a ceramic face. I mean, these are so beautiful. If I were a pro, I'd probably, I don't know how quickly I'd wear out this face. Maybe I'd go with a ceramic face. That was a little healy. Yeah, I would go with more of a ceramic face. This divot's not going to stay in. I need to line it parallel to it. Yeah, it's a nice breezy, cool Wisconsin day here. Ugh. All right, let's uh, hit one more here and we will go back to the studio. I mean, absolutely lovely. I feel like when it comes to irons, I can't think of anything that feels that much better than these ever made. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Why did you change, McGregor? What happened here? So I really like these. I like the look. I like how that dark face contrasts with the rest of the face, gives you a nice alignment aid. I like how they feel. I like the swing weight, everything about this. It's just absolutely superb. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. McGregor Turney, copper face. So this is a wonderful iron. Like I said, anything after, it seems like after I hit that hickory niblick, I don't remember when that video will come out, maybe a couple of weeks ago, anything, seems like a revelation compared to those clubs. This one felt like a really good blade. As far as when I'm actually hitting a club, 
I can't tell the difference between this and a modern club. All right, like you take a brand new Mizuno or Titleist or TaylorMade Blade, and I hit this compared to that, and I'm just like, I, they, they feel the same. Looking at it, it looks very different. I do really like the dark face, how it contrasts and frames the ball. Just my opinion, I love that. It looks broken in and worn and used. I'm not like, ooh, shiny new. Am I going to scratch it this hit? I don't think, though. I'm just like, oh, it looks great. Line the ball up. Let's go. So very excellent club. In fact, I have already bought a set of these, and I'm going to team it with my 1954 945 W persimmon driver, which you may have watched in a previous video. So well, I love these clubs. Now, we need to get to the discussion about the materials and the science and the marketing behind it. And they were doing the same thing they do nowadays. Like recently, I've seen, not like this year, but recently in the last few years, I've seen Mizuno advertise their copper, you know, underlay on their chrome clubs. They're like, oh, well, we use copper underneath the chrome for a softer feel. Blah, blah, blah. And you, you, does it really matter? Does it, do we care what's inside of the puzzle that they're, they build here? Like my friends and I recently, okay, so we like puzzles here in my house and we're putting together a puzzle and we had this big discussion about how you make puzzles. And then, so we're, and then so we're like, all right, well, let's come up with ideas and then we'll search for it and figure out what happened. So do you guys know how they make puzzles? So we're like, they could take a big cylinder and they can just roll it across you know, a puzzle, then you'd get a nice cutting surface. It would, you wouldn't need a yeah, huge hydraulic press to do it. And you wouldn't, you know, it would, you could do that nice and easily and you could just roll one through after another and you can mass produce these really efficiently. And then we're like, well, how would you make that? How would you make that roller? We're like, yeah, well, you, it would take a lot of work. And then we ended up Googling it. And the other theory was you just, you know, have a press, a hydraulic press and just stamp them out. All right. That's what they do. So they just take this cardboard picture, they slide it in there, and then they just have this hydraulic press, which I found out, according to YouTube, YouTube never lies, they have, a, they make them by hand. They make each puzzle shape by hand, and they, they take these little blades, and they bend them to the right shapes, and then they combine them all, and then it stamps it. We were like, whoa, that's really cool. And the, and the ultimate question is, it doesn't matter how they make a puzzle. Because when I was a child, I thought they had a jigsaw, you know, because it's a jigsaw puzzle. So I thought they had a saw and they cut each piece out individually. You know, can you imagine a 3,000, we're working on a 3,000 piece Waldo puzzle. Can you imagine cutting every piece out with a jigsaw individually? That would take forever. I mean, you, you know, $30,000 for a puzzle. Well, you know, was, yeah, well, it was two months of man manual labor for that. Needless to say, doesn't matter. Okay, either way, we're putting together a puzzle and it's fun and it ultimately comes down to the people putting together the puzzle on how quick they solve that. doesn't matter how it's manufactured. doesn't matter if it was made by hand. doesn't matter if it was just stamped out. So what does it matter? They can make all the claims they want. Maybe they can make it sound differently if they want and people do that nowadays. It's like an exhaust on a car, same with a driver or a club. If we want it to sound like this, we're going to make it sound like that. But what effect does it have on my golf game? As long as it's the center of gravity is somewhere in this face region and it's not off, you know, in Timbuktu like that hickory niblick I hit, ultimately it doesn't matter. So to me, this is a very playable club. I don't see this as any better or worse than any golf implement made today. And they're still marketing back then. A softer face for a softer feel, for more spin, for more control, for a better look. It was all marketing. We don't care how it was put together. Is the iron the right loft? Does it go the right distance? Is it going to work? The answer is yes. I totally just hit my, I'm sitting on a metal table and I just, it made a nice bell ring. I'm not sure if my microphone's going to pick that up. Either way, let me know your thoughts about the McGregor puzzle maker, the PT2 <laughs> McGregor Turney copper face irons from 1958. Like I said, I already have a set already have a driver. I need to get a three wood for it. And I'm pretty sure what putter I'm going to use. If you can guess, let me know in the comments below. What putter would you use for your McGregor set? And I'd like to say thank you to my patrons. I really appreciate your support. On a Patreon, I offer general support. I post a few behind the scenes pictures and stuff on that platform. Again, I'm also going to post my social media because sometimes People say, well, I messaged you on this platform. I'm not on those forums. I'm not on those platforms. These are all my social media accounts. If you want to contact me, use one of these methods. And you can also support me by visiting my Amazon shop. I am an Amazon associate. I make proceeds from qualifying purchases. The link will be in the description below. Thank you, everybody, for watching. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe. I am The Vintage Golfer.
But regardless of that for now, uh, I want you to hit a few shots. We got a nice reasonable tight lie here. We'll see what happens. Don't take anything yet. So let's just see what it looks like off the ground. And I'm also going to take some video. So that's a form of bottoming out too soon. You didn't hit behind it, but you hit up. You did it on the up side. That's why you get a thin. Yeah, that's that too. Okay, same thing. Yeah, I'll turn the video on it. 